brothers and sisters in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ I want to take this opportunity to start the Word of God with you the song I just sang at the beginning speaks to the scripture that I want to use as text um, for the ministry of the word. I want to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. I would continue to about verse 9 but for today I want to look at verse 6 in particular but for completeness I have to start from verse 5. Now let us read um, I'm, I'm reading from the New English translation here uh, you can read it from different versions Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 begins by saying you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. That's the end of verse 6. Now, in this short uh, presentation I want to make, I want to challenge our understanding. I also challenge myself, the understanding I have, now, I firmly believe that true Christian belief allows you to re-examine your understanding of the Word of God always. Now, one of the things that I have discovered among Christians is that people sometimes hold on to things, not because they really understand what they believe, but it's because that's how we have always done it. That is a belief. That becomes a tradition because that's how we have always taught this. That's, that's how we have always taught this. That's how our forefathers always taught this. That becomes a tradition. I think that the correct spirit when you approach scripture requires you to humble yourself under the power of the spirit who reveals the word 
and allow the spirit to read the reread scriptures for you. Now, the Apostle Paul in this section is concerned with exhorting Philippian uh, believers to have the same mind which cultivates unity in the church. This mind which they are to have is what Christ Jesus heard. Now, once you say this attitude toward one another or this mind, mindset, mind toward one another, which Christ Jesus had, immediately something is set off when you say which Jesus Christ he had. When? The question you should ask yourself is when did he have that? When did he have that mindset? You see? Which Christ Jesus had, which means this is referring to some point where something else happened, which we are being asked to imitate by the guidance and by the motivations that the Spirit of God impresses upon our hearts, the influence of the Spirit upon our hearts. So he says, at some point, there's this thing which happened. Christ Jesus had this mindset. It's clearly a reference to some point in time. What's that point in time? Who? Now, here's the point. Who, though he existed in the form of, of God. Who, though he existed in the form of God. Now, one of the things that I have discovered in listening to people talking about it could be this scripture or many other scriptures that refer to Jesus and essentially point to his deity, to his being God. Now, is that we, there are certain things that we fail to get because of language barriers, of even the people who translate for us, they also struggle to find the best way to convey what the original is saying, the original text in the original language in which the apostle wrote is saying. Now, when you say, who, though he existed, when? So you, you have to pose a question, when? Who, though he existed, when? When did he exist? Does he have a beginning of his existence? Or has he always existed? Or did he exist and cease to exist? These are questions which come up to the mind as you read the text. Now, in the original, the word existed essentially speaks of a continued state, a continued state. So essentially, you can say, who though he continued to exist. That's what that word is saying. It's, it's, it's a state that continues. It's not a state that used to be there and stopped to be there. It's, it's always there. Who continued to exist in the form of God? Now, that's very important. I don't want you to lose that part. Who continued to exist in the form of God? Now, once we say that, it implies that Jesus Christ is eternal. He has always been there before anything else was created. He has always been there. He has continued to exist in that form. 
Even after creation, he has been in that form. Even after being born of a virgin into this world of fallen man, he continued to exist in that form. Very important to lay emphasis on that word. He existed in the form of God. Now, this is a very much disputed word because sometimes we don't get to understand the depth of what the Spirit is conveying. Now, in the original text, the word used here, which is mofer, I hope I'm pronouncing the, the Greek word correctly, mofer or mof, this word refers to substance, that stuff out of which something is made or that stuff which constitutes something. Now, that substance never changes. It stays the same from time to time to time to eternity. It doesn't change. That substance which doesn't change, that reality of a being, that's what we call a being. So in other words, the, what, what the apostle is saying that Jesus has always and continues to exist in the form of God. That substance which makes God God is the substance which Jesus always had and continues to have. Now, important. I'm a human being. I run short of words to discuss an infinite God. I must, I'm wise enough to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that even when I'm trying to explain a concept so plainly stated in scripture, I might even fail to explain it correctly because of weaknesses in language. So that substance which makes God God, that very substance is the substance that made Jesus or that Jesus was. He was that very substance. So now the, the apostle is saying he existed in the form of God. Now, since I'm saying here form refers to that unchanging, that unchanging part, that unchanging uh, substance, which we can easily call being, so that we can say, who, though he existed in the being of God. I think that sounds much better. Being that fundamental reality, which doesn't change from eternity to eternity. That's what makes God, God. He is a being. He doesn't change. Now, some people would say form just means he had a likeness to God. There are people who say that. They will say, no, 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 this scripture is not showing us that Jesus was and is God. It simply says he was in the form of God, which means maybe he had a likeness of God. Now, I want to put it to you that the word form here and the specific word used by the apostle, which is mofer, has words within its family that are very close to it, such as schema or scheme. Now, if you look at a baby born today, the baby has something that doesn't change in them, which is the essential humanity that they are. They are a human being. So being a human being doesn't change. Whether you are still a little babe 
who doesn't know anything or whether you are a gray-haired man, you are still a human being. That's, that's, that's the unchanging part. But notice, the baby is going to grow up, become a toddler, uh, begin to go to school, be becomes a youth, marries, starts a family, becomes an old man, and eventually dies. That which happens to the outward, outward board, it is the scheme that is changing from what you appear to be when you are a babe to what you appear to be when you are gray head. That scheme, it's, it's a form, but in this case, the word that appropriately describes it is scheme. The scheme is changing over time. The outline of my physical body is changing over time. But the essential thing, which is being a human being, stays the same even if I am an infant or an old person. Now, that is not the exact thing here, but I think it draws very close to what the scripture is saying. So Jesus existed in that unchanging form of God, which is the substance that makes God God. Right? Now, here is the next thing. Since we know that God is eternal, God does not die. God is eternal. God um, pre-existed time. God pre-existed creation. He created the creation. Then we are saying all these things apply to the Lord Christ Jesus. Now, what does the Apostle Paul say in this 60 verse? Who, though he existed or continued to exist in the form of God, did not regard equality with God. Now, <clears throat> did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Now, let's start from a very basic premise. If I talk about equality, this presumes that you got, mathematically, you got two quantities and you are saying this quantity and that quantity or this number and that number are equal. There is equality between them. Now, you can't talk about equality of something to itself. I mean, it's a waste of words and time because it is always the case that something is itself. It is a waste of words to say one is equal to one because you haven't said anything. One is itself, that's it. Now, when scripture says he existed in the form of God, that is, the very substance that makes God God, Christ Jesus, had that substance which makes God God. Now, because he had that substance which makes God God, that makes him equal with God. And here scripture says, even though he was equal because of that unchanging substance which makes God God, which he shared with God, he therefore was equal with God. Now, I want you to see something here. We want to pay attention to, 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 to language. With 
God, equality with God. You can't talk about equality if you are referring to the same person. I can't say Marire is equal to Marire. That is a waste of words and energy and time. He existed, and you can't, I can't even say, even though Marire existed in the form of Marire. He did not regard equality with Marie. That doesn't make sense. I'm trying to put it in, in the most basic sense so that we see that sometimes failing to pay attention to words, to grammar, to syntax, makes us make erroneous interpretations. This particular scripture here is clearly showing us that Christ Jesus is being equated to some other who is God. And Christ Jesus always existed in the form of this other who is God. Now, he did not regard this equality is something to be grasped. Now, this, this last expression is something to be grasped or to be clinged to or to be held as a prize doesn't carry any meaning if we insist that this verse is just talking about God himself. It's just using indirect language. Christ Jesus existed in the form of himself and he did not regard equality with himself as something to be grasped. Does that verse make any sense? But that's exactly how people read this verse. I've listened to people multiple and countless times explaining this verse. When they get to this, they just say, it's him, he, it's just God, it's just God, he, he, it's just God, that's how they put it, right? So you're saying, even though he existed in the form of himself, that is Christ Jesus, he did not regard equality with himself, that is Christ Jesus, as something to be grasped. That is a nonsensical statement with all due reverence, that statement becomes nonsensical. It doesn't mean anything. Christ Jesus always existed or continued to exist in the form of God. What that sentence means is the substance that makes God God. Christ Jesus is made up of that substance, is, has that substance. Because of having that substance, he duly is regarded as equal with God, which also means he is indeed God. Now, the part which says, he did not regard that very equality is something to be grasped becomes a very important phrase and it now makes sense once we understand this and appropriate, appropriately uh, take everything as given in the scripture. In other words, what he's saying is someone is equal to me. Now, for a moment, let's say my wife, as an, as an illustration, my wife has the same, the same substance that makes me me, and so she is equal to me. Here is a task. Somebody must forego their privileges of being God and assume the state of a servant, which is a state of humiliation. Now, my wife could say to me, 
why should I be the one to forego my privileges and not you? Why should it, why should it not be you? Why should it be me, right? Just listen to this, uh, in this hypothetical dialogue I'm giving you. When my wife is making the argument that why her and not me? Why should she be the one to humble yourself, to make yourself a doormat? What she is doing in making that argument is to regard equality with me as something that has to be clinged to as a prize. She is saying, no, no way. We are equal. I can't do this. Why not you? She is holding on to, to that equality, right? Now, this scripture is saying, our Lord Jesus Christ, even though he had all the divine attributes and privileges and prerogatives and the very substance that makes God divine, that makes God God, he did not hold on to that as a price. Do you get the point? He did not hold, hold on to that as a price, as a trophy. He did not hold on to that as a trophy that cannot be let go. Do you see the point that the scripture is, is bringing up? He for he he forwent these privileges of this divine nature years. The manifestations of that divine nature, he forwent them and became a servant. Now, here is a problem. If someone reads 2 verse 6 in the following way, Let's start from verse 5. I want to read you in the sense that I always hear people explaining this scripture. You should have the same attitude or mind towards one another that Christ Jesus had, who, though he existed in the form of Jesus Christ, did not regard equality with Jesus Christ as something to be grasped. The way I read it, that's the way people interpret this. So they, they would replace God with Jesus Christ, replace God with Jesus Christ. Then they would say, no, you see, it is just the same God who changed his mode of existence. So he was the father, then he changed himself into the son so that he did not regard equality with himself to be something that should be grasped and so he became a servant okay so it's the, it's the same one who is changing the mode of his existence or the mode of his manifestation do you see that and now he became a servant now that is at least in my judgment not clearly honest to the spirit of the scripture. The scripture is saying, Christ Jesus the Lord had the same substance that is in God. And notice that here God can appropriately be replaced with the word Father. So he's saying, who? though he existed in the same form with the same substance as the father that's what this scripture is saying he did not regard equality with the father as something that should be held onto like a trophy There is a distinction of a distinction of persons here, but I'm not saying we have two gods. We have one God, 
but here manifests as persons. So the father, the substance that makes the father God is the same substance that makes our Lord Jesus Christ, the son, God. That's what the scripture is saying. So now, even though he is equal to the Father, because the substance that constitutes that that constitutes that state of being God is in him as it is in the Father, he did not say, Oh, but I'm equal to you. Why should I be the one to go down and be a servant? And experience sorrow and suffering for fallen men. He did not do that. That's what the apostle is teaching here. He forewent the prerogatives of being God, the privileges of being God. It doesn't mean that he emptied himself of that form because it says he continued to exist in that form. What, what he forewent are the manifestations of being God, the glories that, that are of God. He, there are certain prerogatives he forewent for him to be able to come as a servant. But he was still God. Even when he was a servant, he was still God. He still had the form of God, but the manifestations, the privileges, the, the, the glories of being God, some of them were now hidden. He couldn't exercise them. For if he had done so, then maybe, maybe we wouldn't have had this salvation we have today. So you remember, for example, he says to those Jewish leaders when they, when, when, when they sent soldiers to arrest him, he said, look here, do you know that if I wanted, I would have called millions of angels from heaven to fight for me? But what, what that tells you is he chose not to exercise certain privileges of his nature. You see that? He chose not to exercise those because if he did, then there was no cross. He would not go to the cross. So, so being this eternal, this majestic, this glorious, this immortal God who has become man, He had to continue in that state of humility to be able to redeem us. And so, since he existed in the form of God, I, I don't know how I can explain this, but I think this scripture, <laughs> it's something else. But let's try to see, let's try to see other portions of scripture. I don't want to, to appear to be forcing scripture to say what it is not saying. But I'm clearly showing you what I understand from scripture. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ has finished his ministry. These are the last hours of his life on earth as a, as a man. The second man. The last Adam. Now, he makes this very important prayer in John chapter 17. And he lifts his eyes up to heaven and prays to the Father. That very hour for which you sent me has come. So, Father, glorify your Son. Now, I, I'm saying... If language means anything, then we must pay attention to language and grammar before we gloss over things. He is praying here to be glorified by someone. You can say Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, referring to himself. 
the hour has come, glorify your son. That is, oh, I want to glorify myself. Because if you say it's the same person here, then it means he is praying to himself and he is asking himself to glorify himself, right? And the son may glorify you and look at that reciprocation so that the son may glorify you. He is just saying, I will glorify myself. That's what it means according to the interpretation that people make. Even as you gave him authority, or he's just saying, I gave myself authority over all flesh. Is that what he's saying here? That to all whom you have given me, oh, he's saying again, he, he, gave, him, he gave people to himself. Is that what he's saying here? You see, if people try to force scripture to say what they already believe, they can surely, surely miss what the words are saying. Jesus is praying to the Father. This means that Jesus and the Father are not the same person. They are not. If they are the same person, why is Jesus praying to himself? Why does he want to be glorified by himself? Why does he have then to glorify back himself for being glorified by himself? Why does he say, I have given myself authority over all flesh? Why do you need to give yourself authority when you already have that authority? Why does he say, all those you have given me to give eternal life? He already have them. Why is he saying give, give, give? Because the moment you talk about give, given, you gave me, of necessity and logical, it means someone is on the one hand giving and the other is taking. It's a gift. Those you gave me, that I may give them eternal life. If we are to be consistent with our interpretation of the word give, if we say Jesus Christ gives eternal life to us, what does that mean? It means we are receiving what he gives. Now, just go a step back. He says, Father, all those, all whom you have given me, all whom you have given him, meaning the Son, now, does this word given assumes that someone is receiving while the other is giving? Go a step further. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, does it mean that someone is giving, someone is receiving? So you can't interpret the word give differently in the same context where it exactly means the same thing. It always means there is one part which is giving, the other is receiving. Now, listen, the verse I really want to talk about now is verse 5. But let's start on verse 4 of John 17. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. What does the word given again mean? Does it mean that? One is sending, the other is being sent. One is assigning, the other one is carrying out the task. Now, Father, listen to verse 5. Now, Father, this is Jesus praying, glorify me together with yourself. Now, let's stop there. People are busy saying, Jesus is the Father, the Father is Jesus. So now, since Jesus is the Father, let's read this statement using those words according to that interpretation. Now, Father, meaning Jesus, glorify me, meaning Jesus, together with yourself, meaning Jesus. So you are saying, now Jesus, glorify Jesus together with Jesus. 
Does that statement make sense? It doesn't. What I'm doing here is to help dispel certain myths that shroud our interpretation of plain scripture. Scripture is so plain, but we try to complicate it either because it's things we have always believed and we, we don't want to see what scripture is saying. He is asking someone to glorify him alongside that someone, right? Now, Father, glorify me with, together with yourself. With the glory that I had with you. You see? The glory that I shared, I had with you. Essentially, that word means, that phrase means I shared. The glory which I shared with you before the world was. Oh, can scripture be more plain than this? This is exactly the statement we have in Philippians. Look here. It says, Now, Father, glorify me with yourself. I want to start from the next clause. With the glory which I had with you before the world was, right? Now, what did Philippians say? Though he continued to exist in the form of God, which means same glory, he shared the same glory of being God with God. The glory which I had with you before the world was. You can't read this scripture and say he is just referring to himself. Unless we agree that language doesn't matter, then the next question is why did the Spirit give us the word written in a language which has grammatical features and all those things? Why do we need those grammatical features if they are not important? With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Clear here that there are two persons in this. The one who is saying glorify me and the one who is to glorify the other. And this glory of which they speak, they shared it before anything was created, which means Christ Jesus is eternal, just as the Father is eternal. And they are equal because they share the same glory, they share the same glory now, as they did before the world was. Scripture is extremely plain in these terms. The only challenge we have is that people don't want to listen to what the scripture is saying. But we want to thank God because he makes us understand what his word is saying to us. Now, in another place, Jesus, um, I think it should be in John chapter 12, um, then the Greeks came to him and they wanted to see him. They asked Philip to lead them to, to him. And Jesus said, my, I think he said, my soul uh, is sorrowful. Let's just read that as I wind up. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 27, I think to about verse 8. Now my soul has become troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Okay. Now, if Father is Jesus, then Jesus is saying, Jesus, save Jesus from this hour. 
Does that make sense? But for this purpose, I came into, I came to this hour, that is the hour of suffering. Father, glorify your name. This is Jesus speaking. Then a voice came out of heaven. Jesus is on earth. He is among people. The Greeks want to speak to him and everybody is hearing. And he said, then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Someone can rationalize this and say, no, it was just Jesus trying to help people understand that he's God. But that's, that's not the spirit of this, uh, this scripture. It shows you that he is speaking to his father, who is God, who shares with him all this glory from eternity, who has the same substance that makes him God as Jesus Christ also has it. And he prays to his father, and the father replies audibly and, say, and says, I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. Brothers and sisters, what I've done here is to try and challenge our understanding by paying attention to language. It's very important. Uh, I, I don't want you to miss this. Remember, one of these days, our Lord Jesus poses a question to the leaders of Israel, to the doctors of the law, and the Pharisees. Hey, people, who do you say the Messiah is? They said, well, he's the son of David. Now, I want you to see why paying attention to language is important. The Lord paid attention to language features of the psalm. If the Messiah, that is the Christ, is the son of David, then why did David, speaking prophetically, that is speaking by the Spirit, why did he say, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, but they always read that. The Lord said to my Lord, but it never clicked in their minds. Now suddenly, someone here opens their eyes by paying attention to the structure of a sentence. The Lord is saying something to another one called Lord. And suddenly, they fail to answer him. They begin to ask themselves. You see, brothers and sisters, my rule, and this has been my rule always, do not try to complicate scripture when it is speaking to you in very plain terms. So the first rule in interpreting scripture is Try to understand it literally. Then as you study it, if you can see that, well, this is allegorical, the way it is presented is allegorical, it's not actually literal, then try to understand the meaning of the allegory. But every word, every dot, every jot, is inspired. That is why the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, I think verse 17, till heaven and earth pass away, not even a full stop, not even a comma, not even a cross in the law will pass away until it is fulfilled. What is he saying? He's saying pay attention to even some of the smallest things you ignore in reading the word. Things like grammar, the comma, the full stop. Because if you change the position of a comma, do you know that a sentence can mean something else different from what it meant? So, so if we believe that the word of God is inspired, then the grammatical features you have there are inspired. Do not neglect them. Pay attention to them. 
give them due weight for you to be able to arrive at the correct meaning of the scripture. I will continue in the future um, in the same spirit so that we get a clear understanding of what we have here. But in short, Jesus is God. But the scriptures that we looked at today show us that Jesus is not the Father and the Father is not Jesus. But the mystery is this. They are one God. They share the same substance that makes God God. Amen.